Good morning, church family. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, it's page 991, if you're using your pew Bible. So in our study through Matthew's Gospel, we come now to the culmination of Jesus' earthly life and His ministry. This is the goal toward which He had been heading. The end of the road that He had been inexorably heading towards this whole time. This is the reason for which He came in the human flesh. That, of course, is the cross. Now, the biblical writers, they give us very little detail about the actual crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. Many modern writers and even modern filmmakers have uh, focused so heavily on the physical aspect of the suffering that Jesus endured, uh, the the excruciating pain and the uh, unimaginable uh, suffering that He went through, that they focus so much on these things that sometimes the, the how of the crucifixion can almost obscure the the what and more importantly the why of the crucifixion so there are plenty of in-depth uh, descriptions uh, readily available out there um, in-depth descriptions of exactly what crucifixion did physically to the human body of the additional torture and suffering that Jesus experienced that day. We're going to touch on it a little bit, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on those things this morning. Uh, If you're really interested, a very simple Google search will readily find you uh, very detailed and graphic descriptions of what crucifixion did to a human body. So rather this morning, as we look at the crucifixion of Jesus... What we're going to see is how Jesus was hated and mocked by the whole world. We're going to see four ironic contrasts, in keeping with the rest of Matthew 26 and 27, four ironic contrasts that highlight His true identity and His mission. And then finally, we're going to see the ultimate reason why. Why would the Son of God submit to such treatment at the hands of wicked men? So this morning, may God give us all His spirit of understanding and love and obedience. So I hope you've turned there by now, Matthew 27. Uh, We're going to back up just a little bit. We'll begin reading in verse 24 to give us a little bit of context, and then we will read through verse 44. The Apostle Matthew, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, writes these words. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews." Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone. 
This morning, let the heavenly food of your word that we are about to hear and study nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, the bread from heaven which was broken for us. Amen. So a few weeks ago, we saw how Jesus was hated and mocked by the Sanhedrin uh, at their sham trial there in the dead of night, which of course was just a few hours prior to these events here. But now, this morning, we're going to see how really, uh, representatively, the whole world hated and mocked and scorned Jesus. And Matthew's going to show us this by highlighting four groups of people who were there hating and mocking Jesus. And so doing, they represent Jesus being hated and mocked by the whole world. So we're going to frame that this message this morning in a, a, a series of three uh, investigative questions. We try to be good journalists here and do three investigative questions. So the first question we're going to ask is, who mocked Jesus? Who mocked Jesus? So the first group of these four groups that we see here, the first group mocking Jesus is the Gentile law enforcers. The Gentile law enforcers. Of course, that's the Romans. Let's go back to verse 27. The sold, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. The governor, of course, was Pontius Pilate. Now remember, last week we saw how Peter, when in Acts chapter 4, when Peter was praying, he mentioned that the Gentiles were complicit in the death of Jesus. This is what he's talking about. Pilate and his soldiers. So the Roman battalion or cohort uh, consisted of about 600 soldiers. And most of these were higher ranking officers stationed there at the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem. And so at Pilate's command, they brought him into the governor's headquarters, also known as the Praetorium, and they uh, just proceeded to, uh, to treat him this way there in the, in, in the presence of all the, the other soldiers. And what did they do? Uh, verse 28, they stripped him, they put a scarlet robe on him, they twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, they put a reed in his right hand. They knelt before him, they mocked him, they said, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the reed out of his hand, and struck him on the head with it. So let's go through these things. They, they stripped Jesus there naked. Now being naked goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? That's the mark of shame and humiliation. Then they brought in this old faded uh, cloak. This, it was probably an old faded uh, Roman legionnaire's cloak. It was probably a, a, a cheap... Uh, uh, mockery, a cheap imitation of the uh, lavish purple garments worn by royalty. They went and found some plant, we don't know what plant they use, some plant nearby, and they took the thorns, twisted these thorns into a crown. Of course, a cruel mockery of an actual crown that a king or an emperor might wear. And they forced it down in, onto his head. They found a reed and they put it in his right hand. This reed is a mockery of a scepter, a golden or bejeweled scepter that is the symbol of royalty, royal power, royal authority. And they spit on him. And again, we talked about this before. Spitting on someone is one of the most vile and debasing, dehumanizing things that you can do. It's a way to show absolute contempt for another human being. And then they took that reed out of his hand, his own fake symbol, mocking symbol of royal authority, and they beat him with it. Now this treatment was not part of the normal uh, crucifixion procedures under the Roman Empire. This was well beyond what any regular criminal sentenced to death uh, by crucifixion would have endured. Those two thieves crucified next to Jesus didn't go through this kind of torture and mockery. The Romans treated Jesus with far more cruelty than they did to the others. Why is that? Well, we touched on this briefly a couple weeks ago. Pilate, in having Jesus flogged, scourged like this, he was probably, this was probably his last ditch attempt to placate the frenzied mob in Jerusalem and to have Jesus set free instead of having him executed. If he scourged him, if he beat him, if he publicly humiliated him, if he openly subjected this man who claimed to be the king of the Jews, if he openly subjected him to all kinds of degradation and scorn and mockery, if he proved to the crowd that this, he, this Jesus, he's no king of the Jews, he can't even save himself from this kind of degradation and humiliation at the hands of the pagan Romans. How much, more, how much less could he free your entire nation of Israel from the mighty Roman empire 
He thought if he could hum- humiliate Jesus in this way, that that would satisfy their bloodlust. And John's Gospel actually records some additional details that when they had put the the robe and the crown and beat him and all of it, they kept him in that. Pilate brought him out of the praetorium, presented him once again before the people and said, Behold, your king! But it didn't work. It didn't work. The mob became more frenzied than ever. They they demanded Jesus' death with more hatred and fury than ever before. And that's the point at which Pilate washed his hands, turned Jesus over to his Roman execution squad. Verse 31, When they had mocked Him, they stripped Him of the robe, put His own clothes on Him, and led Him away to crucify Him. Now most Christian art over the last 2,000 years that depicts the crucifixion, when it shows Jesus on the cross, it depicts Him still wearing a a, a loincloth of some sort and still wearing the crown of thorns. Now the Gospels never explicitly say that He still wore that crown on the cross, but it's very possible and I think very likely that He did. Matthew mentions that the Romans removed the robe. He never mentions the crown. They put Jesus back in His own clothes then. It was probably out of consideration for the Jewish uh, attitude toward uh, nudity, nakedness. He was already going to be crucified. It would have been counterproductive to, the, to unnecessarily offend the Jews in a, a, a counterproductive way as they were marching this condemned man through the streets of the holy city of Jerusalem. You've probably heard of the the Via Dolorosa. The Via Dolorosa. It's often thought of as the street down which Jesus probably carried His cross on the way to Golgotha. That's probably not historically true. The city of Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt so many times over the last 2,000 years. Uh, Some archaeologists say that the main level of the city from Jesus' day is probably about 60 to 80 feet below the current city. There's that much research that could be done there, but they won't do it. But when they reached their destination, this place of Golgotha, the the hill of execution outside the city walls, then they once again stripped Jesus naked to humiliate Him as He suffered and died. And so the next few verses give us some very illuminating details about what happened that day, but they also make several allusions to Scripture. We're just going to touch on this briefly this morning, and next time we're going to come back and, and focus on those Scriptural allusions a bit more. Verse 32, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. Cyrene, this was a Greek region in North Africa, there on the shores of the Mediterranean. It was west of the city of Alexandria. For you ancient historians, know the, the famous library of Alexandria. It was west of that. But there was also a significant Jewish population in Cyrene. And so Simon was, <coughs> excuse me, Simon was most likely a pilgrim there to celebrate the Passover, coming all the way from North Africa to celebrate the Passover in the holy city of Jerusalem. He may have never even heard of this Jesus before. And Jesus, his body at this point was so weak, he had probably lost so much blood that he was physically unable to carry the cross. Now there's a lot of debate over whether Jesus was carrying the entire cross or just the cross beam. Uh, In one of the Gospels, it uses a very specific word that probably indicates he was possibly carrying the entire cross, which would have meant this massive wooden structure that weighed more than 200 pounds, and Jesus being tortured and beaten and uh, short on sleep, he was physically unable to carry the cross. And so the Romans who were taking him there, they saw this Passover pilgrim, obviously a Jew, uh, standing by the road. He looked strong. He looked healthy. The Romans knew that it was uh, uh, unclean for Jews to carry these things. So he grabbed this, Ro- this Jew, make, I'm going to humiliate these guys even further, uh, force him to carry the cross up the hill. Now, in an interesting uh, historical detail here, Mark's Gospel records for us that Simon had two sons named Alexander and Rufus. And he just throws their names in casually. By the way, Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Clearly, he's expecting Alexander and Rufus to be known to the people he's writing to. Now, Mark wrote his Gospel to the Christians in Rome, who was a mix of Jewish Jewish and Gentile believers in the church in Rome. And then the book of Romans, Paul commends a man named Rufus. He says, the, commend Rufus and Rufus's mother, who is like a mother to me also. Now, we don't know for sure, but yes, I do believe that this Rufus in the church in Rome was indeed the son of Simon the Cyrene. 
and that Rufus's mother would have been Simon's wife, who then became a, uh, a, uh, like a mother to the Apostle Paul. So, so as this Simon is, is, is visiting Jerusalem for the Passover, he and his household uh, become believers in Jesus after a Roman soldier grabs him and forces him to carry this cross. Simon and his entire household become believers and his sons become leaders in the church in Rome. Verse 33, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. Now there's a couple of modern day sites in Israel that could possibly be Golgotha. Uh, One is the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It was outside the ancient uh, city limits, and it's surrounded by Jewish tombs. Another site is called Gordon's Calvary. It's a hill that has sort of a small rocky cliff on one side that sort of resembles a skull, and today that place is a Muslim cemetery. We don't know for sure where. Either way, it doesn't ultimately matter. The gospel writers want us to focus on the what. And of course, we're going to look at the why as well. So verse 34, when they got there, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, which is a bitter substance. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Now, there are several theories as to what this wine mixed with gall was intended for. Some say that it was a a sedative that was intended to keep the prisoners from thrashing around violently while the Romans were trying to affix them to the cross. Uh, Some say it was intended to be bitter, hence the gall, as as they would have been parched and begging for something to drink and then it's further torture to give them something bitter. Uh, personally, I think this was actually uh, most likely a bit of a sedative, and I think that it was probably given in good faith, not by the Roman soldiers, because they had just tortured him. I think this was given by Jewish women. Other Gospels record that there were Jewish women who attended uh, prisoners and such as they were executed. I think this was Jewish women who made it their business to care for the dying. Proverbs 31.6 specifically talks about this as the woman of noble character. And one of the things she does is give uh, salves to the suffering and the dying. But even though this was given in good faith, most likely, by good Jewish women, godly women, to ease his suffering, remember, Jesus had already determined, he had already determined that he had intended, he was indeed going to drink the full cup of God's wrath against sin down to the dregs, and that included every last ounce of physical pain and physical suffering. So Jesus refused. Once he tasted it and realized what it was, he refused to drink any more. He refused to numb himself. He refused to lessen his suffering in any way. And then verse 35, when they had crucified him. Such a short phrase for such a a significant act. Just one verb. One verb to describe the most significant incident in all of human history when they had crucified him the act of crucifixion was excruciating and that's where we get that word by the way latin excrucio from the cross excruciating so the cross the process of crucifixion has now become a word unto itself excruciating a word the 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 cross is now synonymous with the most extreme and intense pain and suffering and cruelty known to humankind. They would have laid the cross on the ground. They would have tied Jesus' arms and legs to it with with rope probably. Then they would have uh, driven nails. By the way, it never says nails here, does it? The only reason we know that is from the account when Thomas came to him after the resurrection and Jesus said, look. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at my side. They would have driven nails into his feet and either his hands or more likely his wrists because those bones would have been stronger. And then they raised the cross up vertically and they dropped it into a pre-dug hole in the ground. And as that cross thudded into the earth, Jesus' body weight would have pulled his already torn flesh down along the rough wood, pulling at the nails in his hands and feet and collapsing his chest cavity so that his lungs couldn't fill up with air. And so in order to breathe, he had to push himself up on his nailed feet so that literally every breath on the cross was beyond agonizing. And in this way, the Romans executed their criminals in the slowest and cruelest and most inhumane way possible. Many crucified people actually lived for several days on their cross before they finally died of blood loss or dehydration or asphyxiation. 
That's as far as I want to touch on there. Because again, again, the Gospel writers don't include all these details. Maybe because people in the first century Roman Empire would have already known these things, been familiar with the process, but mainly because the Gospel writers are not focusing on the how, but the what. And of course, in the entire testimony of Scripture testifies to the why. So again, if you want more information about the cruelty and the physical realities of Roman crucifixion, uh, Google is your friend. When they had crucified Him, what did they do? They divided His garments among them by casting lots. It was the privilege of the Roman soldiers to take whatever they wanted from the belongings of the executed man. And John, of course, gives us that uh, well-known detail that Jesus' tunic was woven from a single piece of fabric. It was a special and uh, handcrafted uh, garment. And so rather than to cut it into pieces, they instead gambled for it. Verse 36, Then they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now the cross of Jesus Christ, it was most likely originally meant for Barabbas, the thieving, murdering insurrectionist who Pilate offered to the crowd as a choice. And as we saw a couple weeks ago, if Barabbas' first name was also indeed Jesus, Jesus Barabbas, this only further highlights the contrast between those two men. And it also further explains this sign. Now, this sign was probably hung around Jesus' neck as he carried the cross and walked out to Golgotha. And then when he got there, they posted it on the cross above his head. This was to tell all the passers-by, oh, this isn't Jesus Barabbas, that failed insurrectionist. No, no, no. This is Jesus, and John records that it said specifically Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, I mentioned that these verses contain multiple allusions to the Scriptures. Matthew, now, he strangely, almost out of character for Matthew, he doesn't give us these specific references to, to the Old Testament. He does that time and time again in his Gospel. Now, we're going to look more at the specifics of this next time, but in the meantime, I want to encourage you this week, take some time, read through two Psalms. Read through Psalm 22 and Psalm 69. Psalm 22 and Psalm 69. Read those two Psalms alongside these, these verses in Matthew 27 and see if you can count the number of things here that are mentioned in those two psalms written thousand years before Christ. So we've seen Jesus mocked by the Gentile law enforcers. That's the Roman soldiers. The second group of people mocking Jesus here are the Jewish lawbreakers. The Jewish lawbreakers. Verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with Him, one on the right and one on the left. In verse 44, the robbers who were crucified with Him also reviled Him in the same way as the priests, elders, and scribes. Now these two robbers, they were most likely associates of Barabbas. The original plan, most likely, was to publicly execute Barabbas there between two of his henchmen, maybe two of his lieutenants, as a public warning to any and all who would dare to take up arms against the mighty Roman Empire. But instead of Jesus Barabbas, this Jesus of Nazareth ended up in his place. And so Barabbas' followers mock him. They scorn him in the same way as the priests and the Romans do. There's Jewish lawbreakers treating Jesus in the exact same way as the Gentile law enforcers. The insurrectionists against the Roman Empire and the Roman soldiers who killed them are both treating Jesus the exact same way. The third group of people we see here is just the everyday people. The everyday people. <clears throat> Verse 39. Those who passed by derided Him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Now these may have been Passover pilgrims, but most likely these were simply citizens of Jerusalem. They specifically reference that twisting of Jesus' claim to destroy the temple and, and raise it again in three days. And remember, that was the charge brought against Him before the Sanhedrin the night before. They said, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Now, Jesus mainly refers to Himself not as the Son of God, right? But as the Son of Man. But the Jewish people understood that Jesus calling Himself the Son of Man was a claim to divinity. Again, back to that famous prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. They knew who Jesus claimed to be. The Son of God. And then those words, if you are the Son of God. Now, those words should ring a bell for us, right? 
as diligent and faithful readers of Matthew's Gospel, where have we heard those words before? Where have we heard someone say to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, do this? Satan. Exactly. Matthew chapter 4, Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness and he said, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Throw yourself from the temple. God will save you. If you are the Son of God, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. Satan tried to persuade Jesus by saying, if you are the Son of God, do this. He wanted, he wanted Jesus, he tried to persuade Jesus to call upon and exploit his unique relationship with God the Father to exercise his divine power and to claim all power and authority in heaven and earth without going to the cross. You see, it happened at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry and now he's trying it again in the words of the people of Jerusalem. But of course, Jesus had defeated Satan before in the wilderness. And while he certainly was probably tempted in a sense here, he was still sinless. And he had already fought this battle, right? Just the night before, as he prayed in the garden and wrestled with uh, with his his temptation, and his his, his stress was so great that drops of blood came from his head, and he he fought against temptation, and yet he he submitted to the Father's will, and he said, not my will, but thine be done. He triumphed over Satan. The people's words are mockery. The people's words are unwittingly the very words of Satan himself. The people's hearts are hateful. So Jesus then is being mocked by the everyday people of Jerusalem. The fourth group we see mocking Him them is the religious leaders. The religious leaders. Verse 41. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked Him. Now those three groups, chief priests, scribes, and elders, those are the three main component groups that make up the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Matthew has referred to them multiple times in his Gospel, but only very rarely mentions all three together. So here he's emphasizing the fact that the entirety of the Jewish leadership has conspired to have Jesus killed. And in the same way, he includes representatives of the Gentiles along with the Jewish insurrectionists and the regular Jewish citizens and the Jewish religious leadership. And all this put together is Matthew underscoring what John said in his Gospel. John 1.1 Jesus the Messiah came to His own and His own people did not receive Him. The whole world is mocking Jesus. And how did they mock Him? Verse 42, They mocked Him saying, He saved others. He cannot save Himself. He is the King of Israel. Let Him come down now from the cross and we will believe in Him. Would they have though? (laughs) No. They wouldn't have. If Jesus had somehow miraculously come down from the cross right before their very eyes, they still would have found a way to explain it away. Or even to put Him back up there. They didn't believe Moses and the prophets. Jesus said, Neither will they believe if someone comes back from the dead which proved to be true. And in the same way, they would not have believed even if He came down from the cross. Verse 43, they continued mocking Him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver Him now if He desires Him. For He said, I am the Son of God. Now remember, uh, perhaps they were remembering what had happened uh, three uh, years earlier when the, 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 the Pharisees and the priests came to witness Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River at the hands of John the Baptist. What happened then? The heavens opened. The Spirit of God descended upon Him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is My beloved Son. With Him I am well pleased. Oh, Jesus, if you think God is so delighted and pleased with you, then save yourself. But you're still up there on that cross, aren't you, Jesus? Jesus. You're hanging on a tree, which was the sign of being under God's curse. So clearly, God is not delighted in you. You are not the beloved Son of God, Jesus. God hates you. God has cursed you. God has rejected you. God has forsaken you. Now, in a sense, that was actually true, though, wasn't it? We'll talk more about that next time. It was true, but not in the sense that they thought and not for the purposes that they were claiming. 
So Matthew has shown us now how Jesus was mocked by both the Jews and Gentiles, by both the law enforcers and the law breakers, by both the everyday people and their religious leaders. And in this way, he's saying that Jesus was mocked and hated by the entire world. And the entire world still hates and mocks Jesus today, don't they? The world hates Jesus Christ. And so guess what? What Jesus himself said, if we look and sound like Jesus Christ, they're going to hate us too. Christians are almost always the butt of jokes in movies and music and TV shows, news media, social media, politics, every area of culture and life. Jesus Christ and his people are mocked and reviled. He told us to expect as much. So when it's your turn, beloved, when it's your turn to be mocked, scorned by your family or your friends, your coworkers, your employers, for the sake of the truth of Jesus Christ, when it's your time to decide if you are going to do what you know is right, even if it's costly, what will you do? Will you be ashamed of Him? Will you join in the mocking and the scoffing? Or will you stand? Will you declare your identity and allegiance with Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the King of all the universe? So we've seen the whole world mocking Jesus then. The second uh, investigative question we want to ask is what ironic contrasts do we see? So we've been looking at so many of these ironic contrasts all throughout chapter 26 and 27. This passage is just absolutely full of them. Let's go back through those four groups of people who mocked Jesus and take them one at a time. So the first thing we want to look at is the Romans mocking versus Jesus' true authority. The Romans mocking versus Jesus' true authority. Pilate and his Roman soldiers were mocking and torturing Jesus. Why? Because he claimed to be the king of the Jews. They had that mock royal robe, the mock scepter, the mock crown, that public spectacle of degradation and humiliation. But of course, Jesus was the king, wasn't he? He actually was the king of the Jews. And more than that, he's God the Son incarnate. He's the rightful ruler of the entire universe. He's the one whose image Caesar bears, you remember. Pilate only had power because the Romans put him there. The Romans only put him there ultimately because God decreed it to be so to accomplish Jesus' earthly mission. Pilate and his soldiers had no real, intrinsic, inherent power or authority over Jesus. The one that they were scorning and mocking, the one they were spitting on and humiliating, insulting him for his claim to be king, was in fact the supreme king, the supreme sovereign over the entire cosmos. And yet Jesus submitted to this treatment. The second thing we want to look at then is the robbers mocking versus Jesus' true identity. The robbers mocking versus Jesus' true identity. Matthew records that the robbers, in verse 44, the robbers who were crucified with Him also reviled Jesus in the same way as the priests. Luke records that they said specifically, if you are the Christ, the Messiah, save yourself and us! Which makes sense if they were followers of Barabbas, an insurrectionist who wanted to overthrow Rome and become the king of the Jews. Save yourself and us, Jesus. If you save us, we'll help you become the real king of the Jews. They had followed a self-styled Messiah already, Barabbas, who was supposed to be there crucified alongside him. But this Jesus of Nazareth, he was no Barabbas. He was no murderer or thief or insurrectionist. They knew who Barabbas was. They knew what he had done. And they may have even considered his death and execution a badge of honor for trying to overthrow Rome. But this man... Some itinerant rabbi from Galilee? What had he done? How had he tried to save his people from oppression? But of course, he was the true Messiah. He was indeed the one who would set his people free from oppression. He was the one who would eventually bring down the mighty Roman Empire, just not in the way that the people understood and by the way, I love that we read that passage from Mark's Gospel earlier. When James and John said that, oh yeah, we can be baptized with the same baptism as you, Jesus. We're deserving to be on your right and on your left. Do you think they knew what they were asking? No. The third thing we see here then is the people's mocking versus Jesus, the true temple. The people's mocking versus Jesus, the true temple. 
They said, you, you're the one who said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Now save yourself, Jesus. Come down from the cross. And of course, the temple was the center. The temple was the focal point of the entirety of Jewish existence in those days. It was the place of God's presence. It was the place where God's priests offered prayers and sacrifices on behalf of God's people. Where they did this to appease God's wrath, His holy wrath against sin, and to achieve the forgiveness of their own sin by the shedding of the blood of animals. But of course, the temple, a physical building made with human hands, was never the literal dwelling place of God, right? For a time, God saw fit to have His his glory shine there. But how can the infinite Creator of the universe possibly be contained within a building made by human hands? How can the blood of bulls and goats take away the sins of men and women? No, Jesus Christ is the true temple. Jesus Christ is the true place of God's dwelling. In Him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, Colossians says. And yes, the shedding of blood is necessary to satisfy God's holy wrath against sin. Someone has to pay the price. The wages of sin is death. So will it be you for all eternity in hell? Or will it be something else? Or someone else? Someone That, that someone has to be perfect. That someone has to be sinless. That someone has to be completely and utterly worthy to be an acceptable sacrifice in the place of other human beings. That someone has to be willing to lay down his life to be that sacrifice. Of course, only Jesus Christ fits that description, right? In His body. In Jesus' perfect and sinless body. He is the true temple. He is the only true sacrifice for the sins of God's people. And that's where it took place. The sacrifice for the sins of God's place, for God's people took place in the true temple. The body of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice took, hand, it took place not by the hands of others, of sinful priests who have to offer sacrifices to cleanse themselves first before they can offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. No, His sacrifice took place at the hands of the great high priest. He laid down His own life. He is the one who makes His sacrifice of Himself on behalf of others. He is the temple, you see. He is the sacrifice. He is the priest who makes atonement. He is the atonement. He is the satisfaction on behalf of all who trust in Him alone. Jesus is the true temple. The fourth thing we see then is the Sanhedrin's mocking versus Jesus' true salvation. The Sanhedrin's mocking versus Jesus' true salvation. They mocked Him saying, He saved others, but He cannot save Himself. But of course, in the supreme irony, it was only by refusing to save Himself that He actually could and did save others, right? He was and He is and He always will be the King of Israel and the King of all the earth and of all the created cosmos. But if He had come down off the cross that day, He would have forfeited His dominion. He would have failed to obey the Father perfectly. He would have disqualified Himself from being the sacrifice. There would be no atonement for sins. There would be no hope for sinful men and women. Praise God that He did not come down off the cross. He indeed did trust in God. He was indeed the true Son of the Father. The perfectly beloved One. The One in whom God was well pleased. The delight. The apple of the Father's eye. So much that as we'll see next time when He was abandoned by the Father in that sense, He still trusted in Him perfectly in those three hours of darkness on the cross. And He came through the other side completely obedient, completely faithful, and completely triumphant. He came not just to liberate the Jewish people from the Roman Empire. He came to save all His people from every tribe and nation and tongue on earth from the ultimate and most eternal form of oppression, and that's sin and death. So now we've seen the whole world mocking Jesus. We've seen these ironic contrasts here. The third and final question we have to ask is why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus do this? And now we're getting a little bit outside the specific text in Matthew, but I think it's important that we get a little bit into it this morning. The cross, the cross you see up here, this is the symbol of our faith, right? The entire world over, people see that symbol. A symbol looks like a letter T. Two lines, 
A vertical line crossed by a horizontal line, and they know that is the symbol of Jesus Christ and His people. Why? Why is the cross the symbol of our faith? Why did Jesus do this? Again, in their various crucifixion accounts, the four Gospel writers, they keep it very simple, straightforward. Uh, Just the facts, ma'am. Joe Friday. But the rest of the New Testament then is taken up with diving into the explanation, the significance, the ultimate why of the cross. Now all along in his Gospel, Matthew has pointed out over and over and over again how everything Jesus did was to fulfill the Scriptures, to fulfill the Law and the Prophets. And so it was. But again, we have to ask why. Why did the Scriptures say the things they said? Why did God give us the Scriptures in the first place? Why did the Scriptures foretell all these things about Jesus, His identity and His life and His ministry? Why did any of these things, why did Jesus have to come? Why did any of this happen in the first place? We've already touched on it. Let's try to sum a bit of this up in one sentence. Now, this won't even come close to encapsulating the entire scope of why Jesus agreed agreed to go to the cross to be treated this way at the hands of sinners. Let's try to summarize some of the main points here. So why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus come to earth, suffer unjustly at the hands of wicked men, be mocked and scorned and humiliated by the whole world, and then die the excruciating death on the cross all in accordance with the Scriptures? The simple sentence I have to offer you this morning is this. To obey the Father and receive His dominion by conquering death and Satan and saving His people from sin. Let me say it again. To obey the Father and receive His dominion by conquering death and Satan and saving His people from sin. In every single thing He did, Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly to obey the Father. And so then at His ascension, you remember, the Son of Man came before the Ancient of Days and was given a kingdom and a dominion that shall never pass away. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth to obey the Father and receive His dominion. And He received this because in His perfect obedience and then His sacrificial death and His vindicating resurrection, He conquered the enemy. He conquered sin and death and Satan. And He really and truly and definitively achieved the satisfaction of God's wrath against sin as He suffered and died, not for His own sins, but for the sins of others. He suffered and died in the place of others. And so, really and truly gave salvation of all people who would ever believe in Him, past, present, and future. He didn't just come to make salvation possible, beloved. He didn't go through all these things, the incarnation, His humiliation, His suffering, His death and resurrection and ascension, just to be up there in heaven wringing His hands and says, I certainly hope somebody takes me up on this. Because if it was left to us, what would we do? As dead in our trespasses and sins, we wouldn't accept Him. No, He came to really and definitively save His people. He submitted to this treatment at the hands of sinners to obey the Father and receive His dominion by conquering death and Satan and saving His people from sin. And of course, His people are not just ethnic Jews, right? It's people includes us today. We're not Jewish. There's no Jewish people here. We're among that group. Every tribe and nation and tongue on earth. And in fact, many people who mocked Him on that day did indeed become believers later on. Acts chapter 6, verse 7 says that many of the priests came to faith in Him. Acts chapter 2, many of the people of Jerusalem who were complicit in His execution. About 3,000 were added to the church on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after this. Luke tells us that one of those two robbers who started off reviling and mocking Him all of a sudden changed his tune and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And as we'll see next time, The first converts after the crucifixion were the Roman soldiers. And ultimately, why did Jesus do all this? Why did the triune God in eternity past agree that the Father would send the Son in the power of the Spirit to suffer and die? Love. Love. 
The reason the cross is the symbol of our faith is because the cross of Jesus Christ is the ultimate and supreme expression of God's love. How can an instrument of death and torture be an instrument of love? Romans 5.8, God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This instrument of torture and death and suffering became a symbol of love because this is where God Himself paid the price against sin. He loved His people so much that He came and laid His own life down. Ephesians 2.4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, He made us alive together with Christ. Or think of Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. Paul says, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him. That's Christ. Having forgiven us, having forgiven us all of our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legitimate legal demands. He, he set it aside. He took our debt aside. How? By nailing it to the cross. And in so doing, he disarmed those spiritual forces of evil, the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame at the place where Jesus Christ was supposed to be the one being shamed. How? By triumphing over them in him. And of course, that classic passage, Philippians chapter 2. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. And therefore, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The cross is the symbol of our faith because the cross is the ultimate expression of God's love. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus agreed to be mocked and scorned. That's why He agreed to be humiliated and tortured. That's why He agreed to suffer and die at the hands of sinners. Because He loves us. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. J.C. Ryle, whom I quote so often, puts it this way. So many of these ironic contrasts here in the greater scope of the gospel and redemptive history, he says, of Jesus, he says, was he scourged? Of course, that's a rhetorical question because yes, he was. Was he scourged? It was so that through his stripes we might be healed. Was he condemned, though innocent? It was that we might be acquitted, though guilty. Did he wear a crown of thorns? It was that we might wear the crown of glory. Was he stripped of his raiment? It was so that we might be clothed in everlasting righteousness. Was he mocked and reviled? It was so that we might be honored and blessed. Was he reckoned a malefactor and numbered among the transgressors? It was that we might be reckoned innocent and justified from all sin. Was he declared unable to save himself? It was that he might be able to save other, uh, others to the uttermost. And did he die at last, and that the most painful and disgraceful of deaths? It was that we might live forevermore and be exalted to the highest glory. Amen, beloved. Amen and amen. The holiest man who ever lived was reviled by the world. Thorns, the symbol of the curse from Genesis 3, were placed on the head of the only one who never sinned. The lowest act of human hatred in all of history resulted in the greatest act of God's love for all eternity. The darkest act of human depravity revealed the brightest glory of God's purity. The greatest evil ever done on earth resulted in the greatest good ever done. 
What sinful men meant for evil, our loving and holy God meant for good. And so when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, may we see the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love. May we know, may we know, truly know, His love that surpasses all knowledge. May we indeed be filled with all the fullness of God and may all of us be willing in whatever sense He may call us in our own lives to take up our cross and follow our Lord and Master. Let's pray. Father, we praise You for sending Your Son, Jesus, into the world. You sent Him in the fullness of time, born of a woman, born under the law. He was made like us in every way except without sin and also that He might redeem us lost and damned sinners under Your holy law. We thank You that Jesus, the Son of Man, humbled Himself and came into this world to seek and to save the lost. And He did this by obeying You perfectly, being worthy and being willing to lay down His own life in the stead of ruined sinners, as the hymn writer said. And so today we declare and we rejoice the saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even the very greatest among us. Father, in the midst of the darkness and the evil of the, the world around us, help us to see the light of Your love shining so brightly from the cross of Jesus Christ. Help us never to be ashamed of Him, ashamed of His cross or His gospel, because at His cross alone, the cross of Jesus Christ alone, is the place where sinners can find forgiveness and life and freedom. So help us to go forth from this place today and to shine the light of Jesus Christ to the world around us, even if and when they mock and scorn and hate us because they did so to our Lord. And we know, we know and have full assurance that in Him you have already won the victory and that what awaits for us for all eternity is the glory of beholding your unveiled face in peace and love and fullness of joy. We pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.